The second half of these closing chapters of 1 Nephi then are laid out before us. And the way chapter 18 ended was, we're at the promised land. And look at all these incredible things, including ore. Nephi is drawn to that. He seems to be drawn to metallic kinds of things. Sword of Laban, curious ball. Uh, Where's the ore to make, uh, to make tools to build this ship? And here on the promised land, look at all the incredible ore that's here. That's what ends 18. 19 then begins by picking up on ore being used for the ultimate tool, namely the Word of God. It's now that we're making plates that he will write his record upon. And so he's in the, a scriptural mode. He's ended the story mode. He's now entering the scriptural mode, and it's the ore that is the segue uh, element. Okay? So in chapter 19, he's talking about melting down ore, making plates of gold so we, we can record the history of his people. Then he says in verse 6 and 7, I do not write anything on, upon plates, save it be that I think it be sacred. And that's the law that he laid down back in 1 Nephi chapter 6. Right? Don't waste space on the plates. Only say the things that are the things of God. The things that will persuade people to come unto the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and be saved. Okay? That's rule number one of what we're going to write down. So it's got to be sacred. But then he admits his own possible imperfections. Now, if I do err, well, I'm not the first. won't be the last. Even did they err of old. Now, he catches himself. Not that I would excuse myself because of other men. I'm not using them as justification for all, my own mistakes. But, because of the weakness which is in me, according to the flesh, I would excuse myself. It's an interesting way to say it, but basically he's just admitting, I'm human. We all are. And so I'm doing the very best that I can. I hope you are too. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Because there's some really important things we better wrap our head and heart around now. Because the next verse, which flows out of that one, for the things which some men esteem to be of great worth, both to the body and soul, others set at naught and trample under their feet. Yea, even the very God of Israel do men trample under their feet. Now, I mean, I say trample under their feet, but I would speak in other words. So let me make this crystal clear, since I know I've got a few brothers that have a hard time understanding analogies and looking at sp a scriptural symbolism. I keep talking about trampling God, but here's what I really am getting at. They set him at naught and hearken not to the voice of his counsels. That's the problem. But I love the, the arresting imagery that Nephi calls upon. Because it's one thing to say, okay, yeah, I turned a, a deaf ear to God. That doesn't hurt as much as raising a heel against him. To trample someone underfoot? To just walk all over them? We, that's language we use sometimes, symbolically. But to trample the very God of Israel under our feet. Remember we talked about this at the Last Supper? When Jesus said, One of you who will eat bread with me will lift up the heel against me. And how quick we are to condemn Judas for that without realizing, I do that every week. As I partake, I break bread with Jesus in the sacrament. And then sometime before I do it again the following Sunday, I ignore a prompting or break a commandment. And in Nephi's stark symbol, I've lifted up my heel against the bread of life. Now this is stark, this is strong, but this provides the pivot for Nephi. Again, to go from story to scripture, to go to what matters to some people. Well, speaking of ore, some will only care about gold. Others, though, the words that I etch upon it. And I'm going to write down, record the most important things I possibly can. I'm about to do more of that. In fact, I'm about to take some of what I see on the brass plates and reinscribe them on the gold. How's that for an increase in value, right? How's that for an upgrade? I'm going to take some of Isaiah off brass and etch it in gold because you've got to hold on to this because it's these things w that will convince you not to lift up the heel against God because it's a reassurance that God never lifted up the heel against you in fact he never turned the heel and walked away from you even though sometimes it feels like that he's here he's with us we've got to stay with him brethren Laman and Lemuel all of you scattered Israel hold on to hope because that's what I'm going to try to give you in the next few chapters 
he starts scripturally with verse 9. Uh, it's interesting. It's like, hey, while we're on the subject of the God of Israel, as he's just said in verse 8, he then says in verse 9, the world, because of their iniquity, shall judge him to be a thing of naught. Wherefore, they scourge him. How's that for lifting up the heel? And, had, and what's the Lord's response? And he suffereth it. They smite him. And what's his response? He suffereth it. Yea, they spit upon him, and he suffereth it. This is such a profound passage. No matter what they do to him, he will suffer it, which has dual meaning. Suffer it in terms of the agonizing pain he'll experience as a, re as a result, but suffer it in terms of endure it, and yes, endure it well. Why will he do it? How can he do it? Nephi answers, because of his loving kindness and his long suffering toward the children of men. What he does is an outgrowth of who he is. And he suffers because he's long suffering. That is the character of Christ. He, is, he acts mercifully because he is merciful. And he will suffer all of these things and somehow metabolize that vicious venom and not spit it back into people. They smite him, he doesn't smite back. They spit at him, he doesn't spit back. He just absorbs it and metabolizes it and returns love instead of hate. That's loving kindness. That is long-suffering. No matter what we do to him, he puts up with us. And then Nephi, as an incredible scriptorian, pulls out as much proof of that thesis statement as he possibly can. You remember his thesis statement back in chapter 1. The tender mercies of the Lord are over all those whom he hath chosen because of their faith to make them mighty unto the power of deliverance. Oh, Laman and Lemuel, all the rest of our little family here and starting out on the prom in the promised land, could we use some power? Could we use some deliverance? Then choose him out of faith. He will choose us and make us mighty. That's, what he, that's how he's wired. He's tender and merciful. So here it is again, no matter what we put him through, he will suffer it because of loving kindness, because of long suffering. So now let me give you, if that's my thesis, here's all the scriptural evidence to back it up. In the next few verses, he's going to quote scriptures that we don't, we don't have. Prophets that must have been inscribed upon the brass plates, but didn't make, didn't make it through history to, re to remain on the Hebrew Bible. And these are prophets like Zenic and, Z and Nahum and Zenus. And he walks you through some pretty clear and profound prophecies like the crucifixion of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus. Incredible things that were being shown here, including, actually think about this way, Nephi's vision back in 11, 12, 13, 14, where he sees New Testament history unfold. Remember 1 Nephi 10 where Lehi is speaking of the olive tree and the scattering of its branches, but also this prophet slash Messiah slash son of God that will come to atone and be crucified and be resurrected. Lehi learned it from dad. He learned it from the angel. He can now quote it from Zenic and Nahum and Zenus. And part of what that scriptural vision is providing is the aftermath of the crucifixion, when there is so much darkness and destruction across the earth that even the kings of the isles of the sea will be wrought upon to explain, exclaim, the God of nature suffers because his creation is suffering alongside her creator. He, Nephi seems to, well, in this part of chapter 19, he starts referring to the Isles of the Sea more often. Can you see why? He's just crossed the sea. He's come to what he considers some far-flung isle. No idea how big this thing is. But here I am in some new land of promise, and there will still be ways that God can connect with his scattered children. He hasn't given up on us. He remembers us. He loves us. We just have to love him back. And so here, as we now in, inhabit an isle of the sea. 
will still somehow know about its creator. We'll, we're, we're learned, thank, thank heaven we have the brass plates. We're learning some specific things. Thanks, thank heaven we have a visionary father who can explain some things. Thanks, thank, heaven, thank heavens I'm a visionary man myself. And I've seen all this rolled out before me by the angel. But to see it all laid out here, there's something powerful about God's promise. The way Nephi says it in verse 15 and 16, for example, when that day cometh, saith the prophet, that they no more turn aside their hearts against the Holy One of Israel. So, yeah, just stop fighting God, Laban and Lemuel. But just put your dukes down. He's on our side. We've got to be on his. And as soon as the whole house of Israel can do that, then will he remember the covenants which he made to their fathers. Yea, then will he remember the isles of the sea. Yea, and all the people who are of the house of Israel will I gather in, saith the Lord. According to the words of the prophet Zenos, and remember, the allegory of the olive tree is going to come from him, and it's the best, broadest, grandest description of the gathering you'll ever see in Scripture. So that's what he's teaching me. He's going to gather in every scattered branch from the four quarters of the earth. Can you see how personal this has become to Nephi? No wonder he's going to teach his family these things. We've been cut off. It's official now. There's an ocean that separates us from the land of our inheritance. But this is a new land and a new inheritance. And God is the one who's, who's promised it all to us. He's aware of the tree and its roots. He's aware of its scattered branches. Go read Zenos. Go. And it will give you hope that we have not been forgotten. We have not been cast off forever. Again, title page, thesis statement. We're in this, and God still remembers it all. By the way, having served a mission on an island, I love these verses that speak about those on the Isles of the Sea. Mine was a tiny little Caribbean one, Puerto Rico. Uh, wherever Lehi happened to land, oh, this is going to be a, a hemispheric island. Uh, There's somewhere in the Americas, but... Whatever it is, compared to what they were used to in the old land of promise, the only one a Jew would ever focus on, man, we're on some scattered isle. And the tricky thing about, picture being deserted on an island somewhere, and it's a little scary, like, do I have enough right here to sustain myself? Think about Gilligan's Island. Think about Castaway. <laughs> think about the Isles of the Sea. And honestly, one of the things that I have been most blown away with, President Nelson's proliferation of temple announcements is how many of them are on islands because islands are the interesting thing about islands is how cut off they are from the mainland they're hard to get to one of the, one of the reasons there's so many dialects in the philippines is because the philippines are so many islands and island languages come together and converge because it's easy to there's not some kind of geographical barrier that's separating you. Or, reverse the order, languages proliferate and start to separate and distinguish because of lack of contact with, with other people and the mother language. And so again, islands are almost, the islands are like the perfect metaphor for scattering and division and separation. And yet God specializes in gathering in reversing the Tower of Babel, in, in making islands, forming them back into supercontinents and gathering scattered Israel home. I don't think it's coincidental that a prophet who teaches the gathering of Israel more than anybody also promises so many temples to those on the isles of the sea. You're not cast off. And though your island is so small that you'll probably never have enough stakes to really I mean, qualify under the old metrics of who gets a temple? Oh, we're just going to give you one. Because you're part of the house of Israel. And you're as deserving of these blessings as anyone on the mainland. Interesting that one of the original, one, one of the earliest temples in the church was Hawaii. Out in the middle of the Pacific. What a blessing, because it's going to be hard for them to find their way to a mainland. Let's build one in New Zealand. And again, in President Nelson's case, I was looking at the list. How's this? American Samoa, Cape Verde, 
Guam, Indonesia, Madagascar, Papua New Guinea, Puerto Rico, which oh, sent shivers down my spine, Vanuatu, Maui, Kahului, Kiribati, Samoa, Tonga, nine more in the Philippines. Man, the great gatherer of Israel in our dispensation is a lover of the Isles of the Sea. And that to me speaks volumes about God's desire to gather all his children home, no matter how isolated each one might feel. It's there that Nephi is going to turn to scripture that we are familiar with. I don't, I don't know Zenos. I, I don't have Nahum. I don't, I don't have Zenic. But I do have Isaiah. And notice what Nephi starts to do in verse 22. He says he's going to read from the brass plates that they might know concerning the doings of the Lord in other lands among people of old. So I need you to know some history here. Okay. Now, why is he doing it? I, I should have said this one earlier, but go back to verse 18. I, Nephi, have written these things unto my people that perhaps I might persuade them that they would remember the Lord their Redeemer. Which is exactly what Moroni said on the title page and exactly what Nephi said back in 1 Nephi chapter 6. I'm trying to persuade you to come unto Christ. And to do that, you're going to have to know what he's like. You're going to have to remember him. And he's the type oh, that gathers, that loves, that never forgets. So based on that thesis statement, or I should say based on that intention, I'm trying to persuade you to remember the Lord, your Redeemer. Let me help you do that. That was verse 18. Then 22, which I just shared. Let's review some of the doings of the Lord that were on the brass plates. Think about that with the title page too. I'm trying to show the great things that God has done for our fathers. To remind you of the covenants that he's made. That you're not cast off no matter what isle of the sea you happen to be on. So that I can convince both Jew and Gentile that Jesus is the Christ. The eternal God that visits all nations, no matter what aisle they happen to be on. So many parallels here. And so to do that, what evidence can I give that will persuade you, convince you? Well, number one, the great things God has done, the doings of the Lord. That's 22. Then 23. I did read many things unto them which were written in the books of Moses. I mean, if you're going to teach people about law, then there's no better place to go than that, right? But here's the thing. It's not just the law I'm trying to teach. Yeah, we need it. I mean, that's what the brass plates were for, right? But there's more than that. And the next line, I love. This, to me, is the greatest introduction to Isaiah you could ask for. Because he's about to, to turn us loose with Isaiah himself. So what does he say in verse 23? Yeah, law, let's go books of Moses. But that I might more fully persuade them to believe in the Lord their Redeemer, I did read unto them that which was written by the prophet Isaiah. For I did liken all scriptures unto us, that it might be for our profit and learning. Now we often quote the end of that verse, as we should. If you want your scripture study to be profitable, if you actually want to learn something that's personal and not just historical, then you have to liken scriptures to yourself. You have to inhabit them and decide which story am I living at any given moment. You have to study them in such a way that you are stockpiling principles that outlive their original context. So that then you can draw them out, mine them out of the historical material that surrounds them. And now you've got the diamond out of the rough and I can reinstitute them into my own life. Okay? That's the power of scripture study. I sometimes compare it to orange juice. Where you have orange juice, which is both juice and a whole lot of water. And water is easily replaced elsewhere. So let's take out the water and just end up with the concentrate. That's what the principle is. Concentrated truths packaged for application. That's how Elder Richard G. Scott defined principles. So let's get rid of the water, namely what was happening in Isaiah's day or what was happening in Nephi's day. And now that I just have this principle that's way too concentrated for me to actually <laughs> eat it right now, drink it right now. But here's just this principle. But it's so portable now. I can move it into my own context and there add my own water, which reconstitutes the original orange juice in a more palatable way for me. Does that make sense? It's the principle that is true throughout. But I'm replacing the them there then of ancient history with the me here now of personal experience. And no wonder the scriptures are so profitable. No wonder I'm learning so much. Learning how to live in the present, not just how to make sense of the past. You with me? So yes, thank you, Nephi, for reminding us. 
of how I ought to approach my scripture study at all times. I've got to learn to liken. But specifically, who's he likening? Isaiah. And why is he doing it? See, here's the, I love this part. Because what do we know about Nephi? What does he glory in? A lot of things, but he glories in plainness. Now, Isaiah gloried in a lot of things too, but plainness wasn't one of them. And so, why on earth would someone so plain as Nephi invite someone so non-plain as Isaiah to take the microphone? You understand what I'm getting at here? Well, Nephi just told us why. Chapter 20 and 21, he is going to quote Isaiah 48 and 49 in their entirety. So this is our first introduction to Isaiah's words in the Book of Mormon. And before he turns us loose on that, or turns Isaiah loose on us, Nephi tries to prepare us. It's as if he's saying, um, I've got a mission companion. I know I speak the language really well, and I'm super clear and basic, and I just want to make sure that you understand where I'm coming from. But I have this companion that <laughs> who speaks a whole other level. Okay? I'm, I'm Dr. Seuss, and he's Shakespeare. Actually, Dr. Seuss doesn't, isn't plain either. Uh, but I'm really straightforward. I'm like an instruction manual. I just don't want you to miss anything. I want you to know exactly what to do. And I want you to listen to this incredible poet right alongside me. And it's like, why would you do that? And you picture Nephi saying, admitting, well, the power of plainness is that people get it. The problem with plainness is they might not care about what they get. There is a, there is a clarity in plainness, but there is a com conviction in what Isaiah can do. In some ways, let's divide and conquer. On the one hand, we have Nephi, and here's like, it's like prose. And in Isaiah, we have poetry. And so for Nephi, it's instruction. And for Isaiah, it's persuasion. You understand the difference? I mean, there's a really beautiful division of labor going on here. Like, who can teach the gathering really, really well? Oh, Zenos can. Oh, but who else can? Isaiah's amazing at it. And in fact, he does it in a persuasive way because of his imagery and his symbolism and just the poetry of it all. It's so moving. It's like artistry on his part. And me, it's just straightforward. It's like what Elder Oaks used to say about Elder Maxwell. It's such a fun uh, relationship those two had. Uh, really close working relationship when Elder Oaks was president of BYU and Elder Maxwell was the church commissioner of education. And Elder, Ma Elder Oaks always joked that, yeah, Elder Maxwell always has a clean desk because he takes all of the things, stuff he has to do and then he shoves it onto my desk. It's like Elder Maxwell is a master at strategy, but I have to be the, the tactician of how do we actually make that happen on the ground here at BYU. And one of the other comparisons he made that I think is so funny is it's like Elder Oaks was basically saying, I mean, I can't do with words what Elder Maxwell did. And that's so true. Elder, Max, Elder Maxwell's talks, you needed the thesaurus. It was poetry. It was irony. It was wordplay. It was imagery. It was amazing. I don't know if we've ever had an, an apostle quite as eloquent as he. And then on the other side, and this is a set of contraries that are both beautiful in their own way, Elder Oaks, President Oaks, you always know what he's talking about. It's like a legal brief in the most clear and plain possible way. Bullet point A and, and sub note B and today my talk is about and it's crystal clear. And I'm so grateful for his clarity. But I'm also so grateful for the poetry of Elder Maxwell. Elder Oaks once joked and said, yeah, there's a difference between like show horses and work horses. And if I tried to do what Elder Maxwell does, those horses would be running wild in all directions. For me, no, my words are work horses. I hitch them to the plow of my argument and I say, move forward. And we do. No, not, I'm, not, I'm not worried about the artistry. Elder Maxwell, that was his gift. And so if Nephi is Elder Oaks and Isaiah is Elder Maxwell, it's a match made in heaven. And Nephi gets it. Because Nephi is like, again, division of labor. If I want to teach law, Moses. If I want to explain truth, I'll stick with myself, crystal clear. But that I might more fully persuade people to come into Christ and understand who he is and how loving and merciful 
this great gatherer is by nature, oh, nobody does it better than Isaiah. So I'm going to risk your confusion. I'm paying you a compliment <laughs> by crossing my fingers and praying hard that you'll pay the price to understand what Isaiah is going to give you. I'll help you by the end. If you can just handle two chapters, 19 and 20, or 20 and 21, I'll come rushing back in 22 and try to explain what we just did. Okay? And he's going to do the same thing with the massive Isaiah chunk in 2 Nephi 2. Pump us up in chapter 11, kind of confuse us in 12 through 24, and then explain what just happened in 25 through the end. That's what 2 Nephi is all about. Okay? But here, notice what he's going to do. Isaiah will persuade you. Then, chapter ends, verse 24. Wherefore I spake unto them, saying, Hear ye the words of the prophet. And to a particular audience, ye who are a remnant of the house of Israel, a branch who have been broken off, hear ye the words of the prophet, which were written unto all the house of Israel. And yes, again, liken them unto yourselves. Why? More than profit, more than learning, this time it's about hope. That ye may have hope as well as your brethren from whom ye have been broken off. For after this manner has the prophet written. What I love about Nephi's use of Isaiah is it's so hopeful. It's the exact opposite reaction that we usually give to Isaiah, ironically where we're kind of hopeless of ever understanding what the heck he's talking about. Whereas for Nephi, oh, once you know what he's talking about, it's the most hope-filled scripture I could possibly quote for you. Because I know what it feels like to be a broken branch. Think about the timing of his quoting of Isaiah. Newly landed in the promised land probably burned the ships like Cortez did, and we're here for the duration. There's no going back. And so we are scattered Israel. It wasn't some kind of abstract theology for him. It was personal reality for this first family of the Book of Mormon. And in some ways, their departure from Jerusalem through the wilderness, across the ocean, come to the Promised Land, was the most traumatic experience of this founding family of the Book of Mormon. The scattering of Israel was a geographic and psychological, sociological, spiritual displacement unlike anything that ever experienced. A new promised land? That doesn't make any sense to a Jew. No, it's the land of Israel. That's it. Away from the land of my inheritance, my people, all the wealth, yeah, economic display, you name it. And it's like, here I am in this place I'm completely unfamiliar with. Animals I don't even know what to call, uh, or that I hope will melt the same way and I can do it. What? Heavenly Father, please tell me you haven't abandoned us. Please tell us this isn't some deserted island that you've marooned us on. I'm sorry for our mutinies, but please tell me you have not forgotten us. And Nephi is saying to his immediate family, he's saying to himself, he's saying to anyone who's ever felt cut off from God or any kind of separation or displacement in any of those aspects of life, turn to Isaiah. And there is a persuasive promise in his words that God will not forget you. It's not in his character. He refuses to do that. And so if you will liken these words to yourself, you will have hope. And that's exactly what this family needs right now. So Isaiah, will you please come and reassure us? We'll do our very best to understand what you're trying to say. To unlock your imagery. To ponder your poetry. To, to make sense of this glorious scripture. And as we liken, we will learn. And we will hope. So chapter 20, a.k.a. Isaiah 48, begins, Hearken and hear this, O house of Jacob, who are called by the name of Israel and are come forth out of the waters of Judah or out of the waters of baptism. Interesting parallel there. And interesting parallel to what 
Nephi's family has just done. They've come out of waters, haven't they? But then notice this. And keep an eye on Laman and Lemuel and see if they see who we're talking about. See how good they are at likening. All you Israelites, those who are called by the name, those who come out of the water, who swear by the name of the Lord and make mention of the God of Israel, yet they swear not in truth nor in righteousness. I mean, nevertheless, they call themselves of the holy city, but they do not stay themselves upon the God of Israel, who is the Lord of hosts. Yea, the Lord of hosts is his name. Now, I wonder if Laman and Lemuel winced a little with that. Because weren't they saying in the previous chapters, oh, the people of Jerusalem were righteous. That was the promised land. I don't know what dad's talking about. Foolish imaginations. And as long as they're there in the promised land, they're going to get to keep it. They're God's covenant people. Now, do you, does it make sense, all that theologizing Nephi did throughout chapter 17? It's like, no, it's not about just ownership. It's about discipleship. And they lost it. And so here he quotes the perfect passage in Isaiah to put in perspective what Laman and Lemuel have been feeling about themselves. They're like, hey, they were righteous. Dad's the judgmental one. That's such an interesting one. I forgot to talk about it then. So often to disguise our own lack of worthiness, we accuse someone else of judgmentalness. Sometimes they have it, but that was not the case in, for Lehi. But now they ju he's judged them. That's the problem. Well, Judge yourself for then, for a moment then, Laman and Lemuel. And are you just paying lip service to God because you have the right address when you don't have the right attitude? You've been in the right location, but not embracing the right lifestyle. And so here you are, swearing by the name of the Lord, and we're his covenant people, and I'm a card-carrying member of the church, and so I've got to be the good guys, right? And yet, no, you're not staying yourselves upon the God of Israel. You're... You talk the talk without walking the walk. And so, hmm, what promises are you party to? He says in verse 4, I did it because I knew that thou art obstinate. Thy neck is an iron sinew. Thy brow is brass. And talk about great imagery. Talk about stiff neckedness, right? When you're so obstinate that your neck... No, of course you can't look down in humility. You can't look up to God in faith. You can't look around at your neighbor in need. No, your neck is an iron sinew. Your brow, brass, unmoving. So are you so hard of heart and so stuck in your ways and so oh, claiming that everything's going to work out because I'm part of God's covenant people when you're not keeping covenants? No, there's a problem here. There's a need for repentance here. Verse 9, if you skip ahead, he says, Nevertheless, here's the good news, For my name's sake will I defer mine anger, and for my praise will I refrain from thee, that I cut thee not off. So the first eight verses or so, it's like, man, you guys have problems, but I'm not going to give up on you. I promise not to. I'll defer my anger. I'm not going to cut you off. For behold, he says, I have refined thee. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. And boy, that's what happened with the Assyrian scattering. It's what's happening with the Babylonian captivity. It's what's happening with our eight years of suffering in the wilderness. Man, we got humbled. Man, we got refined. Brethren, we've been through our furnace of affliction. And there's, the flames are still, are still glowing hot. The question is, are we as purified as God intends us to be? Or does more purification await? You see what he says next, For mine own sake, yea, for mine own sake will I do this. For I will not suffer my name to be polluted. That's God's justice speaking. And that's what lies behind the scattering. You're not, I can't let you leave, like stay here and, and fall into some false sense of security. Like, hey, God doesn't really care how we live. So we can keep the promised land whether or not we keep our promises. It's like, nope, that's not an option. I will not suffer my name to be, to be polluted. But then on the other hand, I will not give my glory unto another. That's God's merciful side speaking. That's the promise that lies behind the gathering. I have to scatter you because I can't let my name be polluted. But I want to gather you because I refuse to give up. He remains engaged with us even when we're trying to break off our engagement. 
You understand? I love the, com the contrary there, the justice and mercy, the scattering and gathering, right there in what Isaiah is explaining. He then says in verse 18 and 19, Oh, that thou hadst hearkened to my commandments. There's God's if only. Then had thy peace been as a river. Maybe that's why dad was talking about the river layman and just always flowing to the fountain of all righteousness. That's what rivers of water do. And if you could be like that, always doing what's right, wearing down the rocks of anger or anxiety or iniquity, how thy righteousness would be as the waves of the sea. Can you imagine that? Ever crashing, pounding down the stones of sin, the coast of contention. This is redemptive turbulence all the way through. And speaking of rivers and speaking of waves, oh yeah, we've been surrounded by water for a long time now. Here we are in the promised land, finally back on solid ground. Spiritually speaking, are we? He says, thy seed also had been as the sand, the offspring of thy bowels like the gravel thereof. How's that for a reminder of the Abrahamic covenant? Posterity like the sands of the sea and the stars of heaven. That's the promise God intends for you. His name should not have been cut off nor destroyed from before me. Because God will never give up on his people. He's not going to cut you off from him or cut, let you cut him off from you. No, this is a, an eternal covenant. New and everlasting, right? And he intends to keep his part of it and work with us until we choose to do the same. The way he ends this chapter... Because a lot of this has been kind of bad news, right? I mean, he calls them out at the very beginning. He's crying repentance at the start of Isaiah 48. Uh, walk the walk. Do what you're supposed to. God will keep working on you. He, that's what he's been doing all along. All this suffering that you've been going through is simply furnace of affliction, refinement. Uh, he'll never give up on the promise, though. So let's live into it. Verse 20. Go ye forth of Babylon. That's what we just did when we left Jerusalem. Flee ye from the Chaldeans. With a voice of singing, declare ye. I mean, not the way you were singing on the boat, brethren. But singing the songs of Zion, rejoicing in the Lord. So tell this, utter to the end of the earth, say ye, the Lord hath redeemed his servant Jacob. Because if he's redeemed us, we can go back home. He's bringing us out of Babylon. That's the promise that Jeremiah made, right? That we'll be stuck there for 70 years, but... Eventually, we will return. Think about the lost ten tribes. Yes, they were scattered by Assyria, but yes, they will be gathered home. That's what Isaiah is emphasizing for his people. That's why Nephi is quoting it for his own. He ends, And they thirsted not. He led them through the deserts. Sound familiar, Laman and Lemuel? We've got eight years' worth of experience with him, knowing that by him we are led. He caused the waters to flow out of the rock for them. He clave the rock also, and the waters gushed out. All of that is God's mercy in the Exodus. There's the beautiful crucifixion symbolism there as well, by the way, of Christ as the rock being smitten, and the living water and blood of life flowing out from him. There is God preserving his people through the Exodus, and he's doing the same for us. We made it. We're here. But if we started this chapter with justice and then reminded you of mercy, lest we overcorrect, as we're trying to correct, lest we overswing the pendulum, can I end this chapter with one more nod to justice? This is one of Paul's God forbid statements. Don't, don't, don't take it too far. So yes, he loves us. He puts up with us. He cleaves the rock. He gives us the water. He leads us through the desert. But, last line, notwithstanding he hath done all this, and greater also, oh, there is no peace, saith the Lord, unto the wicked. Don't let his justice trick you into thinking he's not merciful. But don't let his mercy lull you into thinking he's not just. Can we prove the contrary here, brethren? We are here to start over, to be replanted in new ground. 
And if we end up growing amiss, just like our ancestors did, then what was the point of being transplanted to begin with? We're going to have to balance justice and mercy far better than our ancestors have. Or we will be forced to face justice like they are as we speak. Okay? Now, if 48 started just, went through mercy, ended just, ooh, and we're trying to correct and overcome the overcorrections, well, if we just ended chapter 20 with justice, guess where we're going to be in, 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 in chapter 21? It's going to be mercy, right? Isaiah is a master at proving countries, by the way, especially the justice and mercy one. I once read the entire 66 chapters of Isaiah and put smiley faces and frowny faces next to the chapter headings of every single one, just to see which side of the pendulum are we on as he's trying to do bumper bowling and keep us in the straight and narrow path. And some chapters start with a frowny face and then go to a smiley face and then go back to a frowny face. That's what we just saw in chapter 20. Others are smiley face throughout. And one side of the pendulum or other, whether it's wickedness or righteousness, whether it's justice or mercy, whether it's crucifixion or resurrection, whether it's uh, scattering or gathering, so many dichotomies in, in Isaiah that are really powerful. But if 48, uh, Isaiah 48, a.k.a. First Nephi 20, if that was more scattering than this next chapter, 49 of Isaiah or 21 of First Nephi, is the gathering of Israel. Okay? We went scattering, now let's focus on gathering. Here's the good news. Verse 1. Again, hearken, O ye house of Israel, all ye that are broken off and are driven out, and that's us, because of the wickedness of the pastors of my people. And that's an important place to pause because you realize I'm not setting, laying down the blame on all the people. It's that their leaders led them in the wrong direction. Watchmen on the tower that were closing their eyes to God's command. You had true prophets. Well, you had some false ones. You had people leading towards God. Thank you, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, others. But you had so many others lulling them into a false sense of security because they happened to be living in Jerusalem. No. Beware those pastors. He goes on, Yea, all ye that are broken off, that are scattered abroad, who are of my people, O house of Israel, listen, O isles, unto me. Isles, there it is, isles of the sea. And hearken ye people from far, and Nephi's family felt as far away as they could. The Lord hath called me from the womb. From the bowels of my mother hath he made mention of my name. He hath made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand hath he hid me. And let me say that again with different imagery, a different weapon this time. He made me a polished shaft. There's an arrow. In his quiver hath he hid me. By the way, we'll talk more about the ins and outs of Hebrew poetry when we get to the big Isaiah chapters in 2 Nephi. But here's a little hint. Hebrew poetry rhymes ideas instead of sounds. And so, so much of it is what they call synonymous parallelism, where he'll say something and then he'll repeat it parallel, synonymously, but with different words. So he'll give you an idea, he'll give you, kind of paint a picture and then he's trying to say the same thing, but he'll paint a second picture. And so in this one, the first picture is the sharp sword. Where is it? In the shadow of his hand, right there in his grip. Let me paint that again in different terms. The second picture, oh, it's a polished shaft. It's a, an arrow. And where is that? Oh, in the quiver. Aha, uh -huh. gotcha. This actually goes back to chapter 16 and the broken bow, and where do I go to hunt, and what had Nephi done as far as his work was concerned? Dad, you've got work to do. Repent and get revelation. Meanwhile, I'll make a new bow, and I'll make a new arrow. By the way, if you go back and look at the, the, tense, excuse me, the, the singulars and plurals, it's an arrow. He only makes one. But then he goes and follows the liahona and comes back with beasts, plural. It's like, what, did you like pull the arrow out and then like wipe it off and reuse it? That's impressive. Well, he had stone and sling too, so maybe he didn't use that. But it's amazing what you can do with a polished shaft. It's amazing what you can do with a good straight arrow. And so drawing upon that imagery with Isaiah's help, oh, as a prophet, I am a 
polished shaft. I am a sharp sword. I'm trying to cut through the mists of darkness with this iron rod. I'm trying to help you see truth for what it is. So, whether you've been driven out, whether you've been scattered abroad, whether you feel completely forgotten, can I cut to the chase and let you know what's absolutely true? You will be gathered. That's the truth. Verse 6. It is a light thing that thou shouldst be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. In other words, that's nothing. The gathering of Israel is the easy part. That's a light thing. Here's something that's even harder. It's to be that light for everyone else. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be my salvation unto the ends of the earth. If you thought it was a big deal to gather Israel, that's just the tip of the iceberg. I'm gathering everybody. Remember, I'm no respecter of persons. I love everyone. I just will have those that I favor those that will have me as their God. But I'm only favoring them insofar that I'm commissioning them to go find everyone else so that they can be equally favored as well. So there in verse 6, I love it because it's not just the gathering of Israel, it's the gathering of everybody. And how did he say it back in 1 Nephi with all of the visions? It's through the Gentiles. The Gentiles are going to gather Israel. And in the process, they're going to gather themselves. Wow, that's genius, God. He's like, yeah, thanks. I've been working on it. And by coming to know the Israelite book and then being changed by that book and then bringing that book and other books back to the the house of Israel, everyone's changed by this word of God, this sharp sword, this polished shaft. Oh, my word's going to come straight and true and hit the target every single time. And all of my children are going to be brought home. That's the point of all of this. There's all kinds of aisles out there, Nephi. I know every single one. Then he says in verse 8, Thus saith the Lord, In an acceptable time have I heard thee, O isles of the sea, and in a day of salvation have I helped thee, and I will preserve thee, and give thee my servant for a covenant of the people, to establish the earth, to cause to inherit the desolate heritages. You see, I'm still paying attention. I haven't forgotten anybody here. It's all, it's all good. It's fine. I've heard you. I've helped. I've preserved. I'm, I'm not giving up on anyone. In fact, I will give my servant for a covenant. Prophets are reminders of that covenant. Christ is the personification of it. He's the word of God made flesh. I give you my word. Literally, he's living among you. And this Christ-centered covenant is such that you can inherit the desolate heritages. That probably perked up Laman and Lemuel's ears. Wait, there's still an inheritance out there? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, he hasn't forgotten it. He's going, it might seem desolate, and yes, it's been destroyed by now, and so there's nothing left for us in Jerusalem. But we can go back to it someday, our posterity will at least, and be restored to the land of promise. The way he puts it in verse 10 and 11 They shall not hunger nor thirst. I mean, he provided for us in the wilderness. We should trust him on that. Neither shall the heat nor the sun smite them. For he that hath mercy on them shall lead them. Even by the springs of water shall he guide them. I will make all my mountains away, and my highways shall be exalted. Oh, Handel's Messiah is warming up in the wings. Springs of water, a true and living way, all because of the mercy of the Messiah. Chapter 49 of Isaiah, by the way, has smiley faces all over it in my book. But what I love about it is how personal it all is. God has, is a sensitive soul. He's a God who weeps. We have a high priest that is touched by the feelings of our infirmities. And as they weep alongside us, they sorrow over our suffering, even when it's self-induced and self-inflicted. And so, because they're so personally involved and engaged, for them, the gathering is incredibly personal, too. What I want to read from here on out in this chapter, 
please see how personal the gathering is meant to be portrayed. It's intensely personal for Nephi and his, and his family. They've just been scattered. So no wonder he's quoting Isaiah to give him hope. Like, it's okay. This is, this is us. It's what we're living through. We are living Isaiah's words as we speak. We've been through our furnace of affliction. He's guided us through the wilderness. Here we are in the isles of the sea. It's like he's living his life and all these verses from Isaiah are pop, popping into his head. Like, whoa, it's all coming together. And there's hope here if we liken this to ourselves. So he says in verse 14, But behold, Zion hath said, The Lord hath forsaken me. My Lord hath forgotten me. And have you ever felt that way? That's exactly what Laman and Lemuel are definitely feeling. Maybe Le Lehi, Sariah at a, on occasion. Jacob and Joseph, so little. They've never had a home to call their own. Daughters of Ishmael, wishing dad could have lived to see this new land of promise. Oh, have you ever felt forsaken? Have you ever felt forgotten? I get it. So did Isaiah. But, he says, he will show that he hath not. God has not forsaken you. He's not forgotten you. You are not cast off forever. And then here's his beautiful poetic imagery to give us that reassurance. For can a woman forget her sucking child, that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? And then he answers his own rhetorical question, in a surprising way, actually. Yea, he says, yes, they may forget Yet will I not forget thee, O house of Israel. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. Those are some of my absolute favorite words anywhere in Scripture. Because what is Isaiah saying on behalf of the Lord he loves? There will be times you feel forgotten. Times you shake your fist heavenward, or at least are tempted to, wondering, where are you, God, when I most need you? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? O Lord, where art thou, and where is the pavilion that covereth thine hiding place? You get Job, you get Joseph, you get Jesus. There are so many who have felt that, including on occasion you and me. But lest we think that God has abandoned us, he reassures us he hasn't and then draws upon maternal imagery as his metaphor. I love that when Isaiah is searching for the ultimate image or analogy, he often comes back to mothers. Whether it's a human mother or a mother you with its little lost lamb, uh, it's, it's like, I, what's the best example of love I can think of? And Isaiah is searching through his uh, poetic and prophetic images and settles on the best one he could find. Ah, mothers. A mother's love. That's God. That's the Messiah. And notice the detail. Can a woman forget? It's not just can a woman forget other people. It's not just can a mother forget a child, but can this woman forget her sucking child? Notice that detail. This is a nursing mother. He's going to draw on that imagery again later on in this chapter. But a mother that's nursing her newborn, it's physically impossible for her to forget. I didn't know that until my wife and I had our first child. And there would be times my wife, we, we, at the temple or something, we had a babysitter for the baby, and my wife would just say, Eden's hungry. And I'm like, nee, 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 nee. it's like, is this some sixth sense? And like, how do you know that? And she would explain the physiology of a nursing mother. And I'm like, oh, okay. I, I missed that day of health class in high school. Um, that makes total sense. And she knew. In fact, it pained her not to be able to feed her child. Think about that in terms of a God who is pained by times where he has to restrain himself and withdraw so that we can do something on what we think is our own. It pains him. I have not forgotten you. It's physically impossible. For him, it's emotionally impossible. It's theologically impossible. It's not in his character. This is a sucking child. And it's compassion, not just physiology. It's psychology. It's, it's not just biology. It's compassion. I'm suffering right alongside you. Come with passion. Suffer. 
I hurt as do you. This is hard for us both, and I want to come rushing in. And he does. What's another image? To have us graven upon the palms of his hands, there's crucifixion for you. With scars, he chooses to maintain, even in a resurrected body. How often do we look at our hands? When we talk about knowing something like the back of our hand, that suggests how well we're supposed to know it, how often we see it. And what does God see when he looks at those scars? He sees us, the object of his compassion that drove him to the cross. Thy walls are continually before thee, or before me. I had a missionary in the MTC that was studying scripture, raised his hand and said, Brother Halverson, hermano, ayuda. Can you help me understand this verse? And he pointed to that one. And I was like, oh, engrave it upon the palms. I love that. It's the crucifixion. Explain all that I just explained. And totally unimpressed, the elder said, well, duh. I mean, I knew that. It's that last line. Thy walls are continually before me. What's that all about? And I was like, oh, <laughs> I don't know. That was a great wake-up call as a teacher that your students might have questions you don't. And they might be drawn to parts of Scripture that you skip over. That's why I'm, I wish we could do verse by verse every single time, word by word, phrase by phrase. But that one, as I pondered it, okay, it's a rhyme. So it's trying to paint the same picture as, it's, as the previous line. It's still showing that we're engraven upon his palms. It's still something he looks at and sees. Oh, our walls, whatever it is that we see around us. Look around. I'm in a room right now. You can see the wall behind me, but I can see the walls on every side. I know exactly where I am. And if I were to see your walls, all four of them, I would know exactly where you are. And if we're engraven upon the palms of his hands, if... If he knows our needs like the back of his hand, then we are not forsaken. We are not forgotten. Wait, are you in the same room as I am? Are you willing to occupy the same space of suffering? Because my walls are continually before you? Where are you? Are, are you really that close? And every time he is. There have been times where my wife has just taken a picture of where she is at work, for example, and texted it to me with the caption, my walls. There are times it's not a picture, but it's a, it's a description of what she's going through, emotionally, physically, as a mother, with the caption, my walls. Because we both know this verse and we both love this verse. And that's all it takes to remind each other, I'm in a certain place that's hard and the walls feel like they're closing in and I just don't want to be alone here. Are you aware of what I'm dealing with? And it's a, it's a cry for help where the other comes rushing in to occupy the same space, to see the same walls, and how can we help? That's the Lord for you. You remember how personal the gathering's supposed to be. So with that, keep reading. And look in verse 19. For thy waste and thy desolate places and the land of thy destruction. And that's describing Jerusalem. In Isaiah's day, it's describing the northern kingdom and, and the scattering of the ten tribes. But it's describing what's happening in Jeremiah's day, or prophesying of that, or Lehi's day. It's going to be desolate places. The land's going to be destroyed. Thank the Babylonians for that. But notice this. All that waste place shall even now be too narrow by reason of the inhabitants. And they that swallowed thee up shall be far away. So your enemy's gone, everyone's come back to the point there's not enough room for everyone. That's what he means by it's too narrow. It's like you're packed in like sardines because everyone's come home. To what? To an old desolate place? Oh, no, we're here to rebuild. We've been allowed to return. So he says, the children whom thou shalt have, after thou hast lost the first, shall again in thine ears say, the place is too straight for me. 
and straight as in narrow. It's too narrow. It's too confined. We don't, have, we don't have enough room here for everybody. So give place to me that I may dwell. It's like I gotta need some elbow room here. Can I get a room of my own, please? Can I move out? I'll, I'll live down the street, but we're too packed. This is the, the woman who lived in the shoe and had more children than she knew what to do, right? And then, my favorite part of this, then shalt thou say in thine heart, who hath begotten me these? seeing I have lost my children, and am desolate, a captive, and removing to and fro. And who hath brought up these? Behold, I was left alone. These, where have they been? And again, he's back to maternal imagery. Again, he's going to a mother. And this time, it's a mother who has lost her sucking child. Obviously can't forget this child, but he's gone. She's been buried. And Talk about a distraught, forlorn, devastated mother. Walking around the house, seeing rooms that are now empty, that used to echo with the sound of children's laughter. Can you picture what she's going through? It's never, I'll never be happy again. Forsaken, forgotten, forlorn. And what's the reassurance from Isaiah? The reassurance from the Lord? Just you wait. Scattered Israel will return. The empty house will be so full that there's not room for everyone that's there. The mother who has lost her children. This is back to Job. Those children, a new generation has come to fill every empty room and prepare to fill your empty heart because those lost children will come back in days of resurrection. There's something beautiful about this imagery in terms of the surprise on the part of the mother and the surprise that focuses on her kids because she keeps coming back to them. It's like, who hath begotten me? These. I've lost my children. I'm desolate, a captive. But, but, but these. Who, who brought them up? I was left alone. But, but these. And she keeps coming back to these, which means they're right there all around her. <laughs> Just scoop them up, put on them on their lap, playing at her feet. And she is beside herself. Thus all the repetition like, pinch me. I've got to be dreaming. This can't be true, but it is. I've shared this story before, but I have to do it again here. Because when my wife and I were first married, we wanted to have children immediately. It took me so long to convince her to marry me. We felt we were behind already. And yet months and months and months passed with painful evidence that we weren't pregnant yet. And my wife, since childhood, her biggest fear had been infertility. Just felt like, I, some, I don't know why, but something's going to happen and I'm not going to be able to have children of my own. And that seemed to be becoming, that nightmare be, seemed to be becoming reality. Well, we saw specialists and after infertility specialists and surgeries and everything else, our miracles finally came. But it was so hard when she was Relief Society president in a married student ward where everybody was having children left and right except her. And she became more and more hopeless and, and devastated as a result until the blessings and miracles came. Okay? Now fast forward oh, a decade and we are living in Tennessee in a really small house that now has seven people living in it. We'd been used to close quarters before. Uh, the year before we moved to Tennessee, we rented a tiny little basement apartment with two rooms. And my wife and I were going to have one. And our first and second were going to share the other. And the third was in a crib in the closet. And the fourth was in my wife's womb at the time. And then her brother needed a place to stay. So he moved in and was originally on the couch. And then we felt bad. So we're like, take the kid's room. You need your own space. And we'll just bring number one and number two into our bedroom with us. And so, yes, it was family of five in one bedroom. And so for us, moving to our own house in Tennessee, it felt like we had like this palatial estate. I mean, it had three bedrooms. And so one for me and my wife, one for the boys and one for the girls, and we're good to go. Well, eventually those boys and girls started getting bigger. And... The fourth that was in the womb had already emerged, and then the fifth came on board as well. 
So now we're living a family of seven in this small little house to the point that some people even wondered, how do you guys all fit? And my wife started wondering that as well. I liked the small house because of the small mortgage payment, but my wife was there all the time with children that seemed to be bursting at the seams and she was starting to feel like the woman in the shoe. And so she would say to me, honey, we, we don't all fit in here. We need more space. And that never came across as complaint in my ears. It was, it was music because I remembered her earlier laments. I'm not going to be able to have children. And later, who hath begotten me these? That is still one of my favorite phrases from Isaiah. I think of my wife and my five incredible children every time. Because they're all miracles. Every one of them. Every one of them. That's the gathering of Israel. You see how personal it is? Keep it personal and read 22 and 23. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will lift up mine hand to the Gentiles. It's going to go through them. We learned that first from Lehi back in 1 Nephi 10. But I'm going to lift my hand to the Gentiles, kind of call their atten attention. I'm going to set up my standard to the people. There's his kind of flag. Uh, high on the mountaintop, a banner is unfurled. Let me set that out. And they, the Gentiles, shall bring thy sons in their arms. Thy daughters shall be carried upon their shoulders. Kings shall be thy nursing fathers. Queens, thy nursing mothers. And remember, it's the sucking child that can't be forgotten. And now who's the, who's the surrogate mother? Who's the wet nurse? A queen, no less. Even the king is somehow getting in on this as a nursing father, trying to be as nurturing as his incredible wife. These are Gentiles out there. What would they be doing caring for the house of Israel? This is Pharaoh's daughter adopting a Hebrew slave child. Here's Gentiles, kings and queens, nursing Israel back to health. Nursing and nurturing and carrying them home. They shall bow down to thee with their face toward the earth. They'll lick up the dust of thy feet. And thou shalt know that I am the Lord. For they shall not be ashamed that wait for me. Yes, some waiting might be required. Patience is a virtue after all. But would you trust me? Will you have faith in me? during your furnace of affliction periods, I'm in the same room that you are. Even the same furnace. Ask Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego about that. But when the time is right, oh, the world will pave the way and roll out the red carpet for your triumphal entry. He knows what that feels like, too. You get this? This is about as glorious a chapter as anything you'll see in Isaiah. In fact, preview of coming attractions, a generation later, when Nephi is ready to pass the baton to Jacob, trying to prepare Jacob to be the next prophet in the line, he assigns Jacob a passage of scripture to, to teach about at Gen Nephi General Conference. And guess what he picks? That one. He says, Nephi, would you go back to Isaiah chapter 49 and go reread verse 22 and 23 about shoulders and, and carrying and kings and nursing fathers and nursing mothers. Because this rising generation missed my conference talk back in chapter 21. So can you repeat it and give it your own twist or your own take? And that's exa exactly what Jacob does. That passage is so important. Every generation of Nephites needs it. So do we. My youngest daughter, by the way, <laughs> loved as a child being carried on shoulders. And that's the imagery there, right? I told you, gathering is personal. We so often make, oh, the gathering of Israel, and it's some kind of political, geopolitical thing, or impersonal thing, or whatever it is. No, missionary work is the gathering of Israel. And how personal was that? Raising your children, teaching the gospel, nurture and admonition of the Lord, how personal is that? I mean, work for the dead, even. Make it personal. Find out their backstories, understand where they're coming from, and wow, when the hearts of the fathers and children turn to each other, that's personal. So it's not just, I don't know, give them a map and point them in the right direction. No, what if they can't make it? 
Let me pick you up in my arms. That's bosom to bosom right there. Let me get, put you on my shoulders and carry you home. My, daughter, my youngest daughter, oh, I love doing that with all my kids, but for some reason, my youngest daughter loved it most. And just, when she, she, could, she couldn't even pronounce it right, and she'd just look up and stick her arms up and go, shoulders, and that was the cue. Dad, I want you to pick me up. And I'd turn her around and scoop her up under, under the arms and put her on my shoulders and grab her legs, her little dangling feet, and pretend I was falling this way and then falling that way and falling forward, falling back. And she was just holding onto my head and laughing and uncontrollably. We had a blast. I, as a father, miss those shoulder-carrying days. In fact, I found out later that my daughter did too because she was probably 12 or something. And kind of sheepishly, she's like, Dad, you think you could still carry me on your shoulders? She could pronounce it by then. But I just laughed because a much bigger version of my sweet baby girl was saying, shoulders. And I, I just laughed them all. Um, you're a little bigger then, and I'm a little weaker and older than then, uh, but we got to give it a shot. We got to try it. And so I'm going to need your help. I can't just lift you up because you're too long. Okay? Uh, so climb up on the couch and spread your legs, and I'll stick my head through and then pray that my back holds. And again, we walked, she on me, showed us around the house. Uh, it was awesome. And to see Isaiah using that kind of imagery, can you picture scattered Israel as a frightened child looking up with tear-filled eyes, reaching out in hope? Showed us. And kings and queens responding with compassion. This is breathtaking. And so Isaiah asks in 24, For shall the prey be taken from the mighty, or the lawful captives delivered? And that's an interesting rhetorical question, because the answer is no. I mean, if you're the prey of the mighty, you're already in the jaws of the lion or the paws of the bear, right? Sorry, you're not going to get saved now. If you're a captive and you're a lawful captive, like you deserve to be in prison, you guilty as charged, are you going to be delivered? And again, the answer is no. But what's the Lord's answer? But thus saith the Lord, oh, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away, and the prey of the terrible shall be delivered. For I will contend with him that contendeth with thee. I will save thy children. Again, personal pronouns. Think how personally God takes this. I'm going to deliver you. I don't care if you deserve to be in prison. I love you anyway. And while I can't rob justice, I sure can allow mercy to intercede. Will you come so I can heal you? Back to the prey of the mighty. Wasn't it the boy David who delivered the sheep from the mouth of the lion and the paw of the bear? He didn't think it was too late. And if a little shepherd can do that, imagine what the good shepherd can do. It's never too late for the Lord. His redemption is relentless. And all throughout this chapter of Isaiah and of 1 Nephi, He's reminding us of that. The very last verse is one more nod to justice, lest we overswing the pendulum. Okay? But through these two chapters, oh, let's stay in the Goldilocks zone. Let's not presume upon his grace, but let's not assume he doesn't have any, or that his grace is insufficient for what you've become. Oh, no. Never lose hope. Do you see why, Isaiah, why Nephi introduced these two chapters of Isaiah with the promise? This is to give you hope. So liken it. This is to persuade you to believe in the Lord, your Redeemer, because that's a Redeemer that's worth believing in. He's, it's one that will never give up on me. That's the message of Isaiah in these chapters, which is what Nephi is going to try to confirm and clarify in his final chapter. This is grand finale of 1 Nephi. This is chapter 22, and it's Nephi's interpretation of Isaiah 48 and 49, but 
he's so plain that sometimes we lose the, the re, sometimes we don't realize that he's explaining Isaiah. It's like, wait, that's what you got out of that? Wow. Okay. Now I need to reread. Okay. And maybe that's worth doing at the end of our lesson anyway. The chapter heading, by the way, sums it all up. So if you really want to just water ski, read this. Israel shall be scattered upon all the face of the earth. That's what chapter 20 was all about. The Gentiles will nurse and nourish Israel with the gospel in the last days. That's what chapter 21 was all about. And then here's the summary. Israel will be gathered and saved, and the wicked will burn as stubble. The kingdom of the devil will be destroyed, and Satan will be bound. And that doesn't sound like chapter 20 and 21. That doesn't sound like Isaiah 48 and 49. Where are you getting that, Nephi? Oh, glad you asked. I got that in chapter 14 when the angel showed me the last days. I got that in my preview of the apocalypse, which John the Revelator was going to write down in Revelation. In a way, he's going, taking us back to, I mean, he's describing prophecy, history, right, unfold with scattering and gathering. But how does it end? Well, with the last days. Restoration of the gospel. It, to me, it's fascinating that now he's bringing, he's scriptural, right? And he's brought in brass plates. He's brought in uh, Zenic, Zeno, uh, Zenus, Nahum, Moses, Isaiah. But I'm a prophet too. And let's go to future writings like the, the apocalypse of John, the revelation. And I'll bring in some elements of what I saw in that vision of mine and bring it all together. Chapter 22 is fascinating. So if that's the water ski, let's snorkel and scuba dive in a, a few places. Because in chapter uh, 22, it begins with a question, just like chapter 15 did. Remember 15, Nephi comes down the mountain, and Laman and Lemuel are like, yeah, what's up with what Dad was talking about? Well, here, verse 1, Laman and Lemuel ask, what meaneth these things which ye have read? So similarly, what are you talking about? What is Isaiah talking about? And they wonder... Behold, are they to be understood according to things which are spiritual, which shall come to pass according to the Spirit and not the flesh? Now, that's a great question to ask anytime you read books like Revelation or Isaiah. Anytime there's symbolism. Is this literal or figurative? Or in their case, is this spiritual or physical? I mean, in their case, they knew the scattering was physical. I mean, we're here. We're on a different isle of the sea. Does that mean the, the gathering will be literal too? Like, should we keep the ship in good working order so we can sail back to Jerusalem once the whole Babylonian exile calms down? Well, mm, that part, no. We're here for the duration. But will there be a literal gathering of Israel? Well, 10th article of faith says we believe so. And if you think about the state of Israel post-World War II, the Zionist movement that began to emerge in the late 19th century, the prayer of dedication of Israel from Orson Hyde when he went and prayed for the literal gathering of Israel. There's a park in his honor right, by, right in Jerusalem itself. It's amazing. So yeah, literal gathering, uh-huh. According to the flesh, yeah, you bet. But is this spiritual too? And as you read chapter 22, pay close attention to both aspects, because Nephi's answer is essentially, yes, it's both. There will be a physical gathering, but the spiritual one is the one I will emphasize most. In some ways, the physical gathering will forever be incomplete without the spiritual one. Because what's home physically if it's not home spiritually? Then we're back to the problem we quoted from Isaiah earlier. They're like, hey, I'm right here in Jerusalem. I, I must be doing well. It's like, nope, that's your location, not your lifestyle. doesn't count. Remember, we talked about this repeatedly in the Doctrine and Covenants. What's Zion? Is it a place or is it a people? Yes, but you'll never be the place until you become the people. So let's work on spiritual gathering. And to do that, he starts in verse 7, to speak of a mighty nation among the Gentiles that, yes, unfortunately would scatter Lehi's seed, but would also be the home to the place where the gathering would begin. Because it's there that the marvelous work and a wonder would start. You see, the physical aspect, yeah, think Zionist movement, think uh, State of Israel, think post-World War II. And yes, there's a lot of temporal support, 
that the United States gives to the nation of Israel and so on. Okay, I'm not going to get into the politics of it all, but there is the temporal side, the physical, flesh-based side. But what's amazing is the way Nephi sees it here, yeah, that's going to happen, that's fine. But let's focus on the marvelous work, shall we? And here in this mighty nation, upon this land, ooh, we're already here, wow, maybe this is part of it. From one promised land to a new promised land, and that promised land's going to bring us back to the original promised land. Mm, two promised lands. I like in this. Okay, an old Jerusalem, a new Jerusalem. Oh yeah, I remember seeing that. I remember John talking about that, prophesying of that. It's all coming together. So speaking of this marvelous work, why is it so important? Verse nine: It shall also be of worth unto the Gentiles. That's how it's going to bring them in, and not only unto the Gentiles, but unto all the house of Israel. After all, it's meant to gather everyone since God loves everybody. It's going to work unto the making known of the covenants of the Father of heaven unto Abraham, saying, In thy seed, there's the exclusivity, shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. There's the inclusivity. See how it's all coming together and how it all is rooted in covenant? And that's the, the primary point of the Book of Mormon. God keeps his covenant by sending Jesus Christ by restoring his gospel, by performing this marvelous work. I will not cut you off. I will not forsake or forget you. I promise. Then verse 11, Wherefore the Lord God will proceed to make bare his arm in the eyes of all the nations in bringing about his covenants and his gospel unto those who are of the house of Israel. You seen the repetition of this covenant language? Then verse 12, Wherefore he will bring them again out of captivity, and they shall be gathered together to the lands, plural, of their inheritance. Now that sounds temporal because it's land-based. And they shall be brought out of obscurity and out of darkness, and they shall know that the Lord is their Savior and their Redeemer, the Mighty One of Israel. And that sounds spiritual. Notice, by the way, it's their Savior, their Redeemer, not just the Savior or the Redeemer. Let's stick with the personal pronouns here. It's a personal gathering after all. And if Christ is being personal in gathering you like a mother hen gathereth her chickens, like a nursing mother cares for its sucking child, then I hope it's personal for us too. Personal in the way we look at our Savior and our Redeemer and personal in the way we look at our brothers and sisters that need to be gathered too. Then something interesting happens. In some ways, he's taken us through his Isaiah explanation, and now he's ready to shift from Isaiah to John, from Old Testament to New. And his, the rest of, of uh, 1 Nephi 22 takes this incredibly apocalyptic turn. And remember, in apocalyptic literature, it's stark dualism, it's good, evil, it's light, darkness, it's kingdom of God versus kingdom of the devil. There's only two churches, right? All that kind of talk. Uh, lamb or beast, Zion or merchant city, all of that that we studied recently in the book of Revelation. But he's going to talk about the great and spacious building, a.k.a. the great and abominable church, and talk about it turning upon itself in acts of self-destruction. Hmm, God doesn't have to punish the wicked. They end up punishing themselves, okay? And then he says in verse 17, Wherefore, he will preserve the righteous by his power, even if it so be that the fullness of his wrath must come, and the righteous be preserved even unto the destruction of their enemies by fire. Now, that sounds pretty harsh, but keep reading. Wherefore, the righteous need not fear, for thus saith the prophet, they shall be saved even if it so be as by fire. Mm, fire on both sides. Fire as a consuming element, but also as a preserving one. Oh yeah, it consumes and cleanses. It purges and purifies. Fire is a two-edged sword of its own, isn't it? Think about the exodus from Egypt, since we've been exit exiting or exodusing all day today. And the fire that emerged right by the banks of the Red Sea to separate Israel from Egypt. It bought Israel enough time to part the waters and start moving through the Red Sea. It would have bought Egypt enough time to come to their senses and go back home. Instead of rushing headlong through the fire, so to speak, 
and into self-destruction once the sea returned to its norm without God's interference. See, it's not that God is destroying them. It's that God is withdrawing his protection. He's, he performed a miracle for Israel. He can't perform the miracle for Egypt because Egypt isn't asking for God's miracles. You get it? And this fire then both destroys and saves it. I hope it wakes us up because we can all choose to go on the cleansing side of the fire. It's the furnace of affliction after all. But then through much of the rest of this chapter, with that stark duality, we're going to see the wicked and the righteous. That's what apocalyptic literature does. And this is a very apocalyptic ending of this book of Scripture. So here are some warnings to the wicked. I'll just roll them off. Verse 14, all that fight against Zion shall be destroyed. Verse 19, all they who fight against Zion shall be cut off. Verse 20, all those who will not hear that prophet shall be cut off from among the people. But meanwhile, on the other side of the flame, and again, you're welcome to come over to it at any time, here are some promises to the righteous. Verse 15, Satan shall have no more power over the hearts of the children of men. Wow, don't you long for that day? Verse 16, he will not suffer that the wicked shall destroy the righteous. Bank on that. Or verse 17, he will preserve the righteous by his power. So that, 17, the righteous need not fear. 19, the righteous shall not perish. 22, again, the righteous need not fear. Because back in verse 20, the Lord will surely prepare a way for his people. Now, what is that way? In fact, better asked, who is that way and that truth and that life? that will see us through the flames and see us through the sea and see us on to celestial glory? Well, keep reading in verse 20. The Lord will surely prepare a way for his people unto the fulfilling of the words of Moses. So now we're back to, back to him. Which he spake, saying, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you. Like unto me, him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. Hmm, what did Lehi first call this son of God? Oh, a prophet. Yes, prophet, Messiah, son of God, savior of the world, redeemer of the world, their redeemer, their savior. But he's a prophet of sorts. And what sort of prophet is he? One just like Moses. One who freed them from bondage. Ah, yes. Okay, this is making sense. He makes it crystal clear, as Nephi likes to, in verse 21, Now I, Nephi, declare unto you that this prophet of whom Moses spake was the Holy One of Israel. Wherefore, he shall execute judgment in righteousness. And this becomes Nephi's new favorite title for this Messiah, for this prophet, for this Redeemer, for this Savior. It's the Holy One of Israel. And yes, he's holy. There's our just, his justice. We've got to to come unto that, but he's of Israel. There's his mercy. I belong to you. I want you to belong to me. Mother, father, paternal, maternal imagery. I'm in this with you. Same room, same walls. So I'm holy. So I'm the holy one of Israel. And that's what Nephi will continue to repeat. Verse 24 and 25. The time cometh speedily that the righteous must be led up as calves of the stall. There's caring for your livestock, led up, not sent as lambs to the slaughter. No, led up as calves of the stall. And the Holy One of Israel, there's the title, must reign in dominion and might and power and great glory. And he gathereth his children from the four quarters of the earth. He numbereth his sheep and they know him. And there shall be one fold and one shepherd, and he shall feed his sheep, and in him they shall find pasture. I love how Nephi is mixing metaphors here. Now, are you the mother and the father? Yes. Are you the, the cattle owner? Yes. Are you the shepherd? Oh, the best one you'll ever meet. And in fact, not only am I the shepherd that's gathering sheep, I'm the parent that's gathering children. But back to the pastoral shepherding 
metaphor. Not only am I the shepherd of the sheep, I'm the pasture that they're feeding upon. I mean, I am the bread of life after all, living water. You could actually go back and reread the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, and realize that the Lord is everything in that entire psalm. If he leads you beside the still waters, well, he's the still waters too. Uh, if he leads you through the green pastures, here we see that it's in him that we find pasture. He spreadeth this table. Well, there's the Last Supper. He's the one <laughs> providing the bread and wine. The Savior Jesus Christ is everything here. He is the Holy One of Israel. And if we can find that everything we seek is in him, then maybe we'll come running. And he'll be ready to welcome us with outstretched arms. So, verse 26, Because of the righteousness of his people, Satan has no power. Wherefore, he cannot be loosed for the space of many years, for he hath no power over the hearts of the people, for they dwell in righteousness. And then one more line, And the Holy One of Israel reigneth. Now, I love the combination there, because there's another set of contraries we need to prove. If we're thinking of this in apocalyptic terms, and Armageddon, and end of the world, and millennial reign, and the binding of Satan, what binds him? Well, according to this verse, and there's all kinds, if you were to slowly read through, I can't do it verse by verse, but if you were to slowly read through chapter 22, especially the second half, there's so many parallels to the book of Revelation, which hopefully is still fresh in our minds from December. But to see at this time period when all is said and done and we're gathered home and Christ is here and, and it's, it's millennial. Satan bound for the thousand years. Children growing up without sin unto salvation. Isn't that what he said earlier? I will save thy children. I love that phrase from the end of Isaiah 49. You parents who are worried about wandering children, prodigal sons and daughters, Bank on the Lord's promise, his personal promise. I will save thy children. And how's it going to be done? Two ways. And we need to prove the contraries here. Because one way, as he says in 26, is because of the righteousness of the people. Satan has power because we give it to him. We hand over the car keys. We pass the reins and, and he runs things. And if we refuse to, there goes his power. But to think it's all on us, careful, because how does it end? The Holy One of Israel reigneth. Like, oh yeah, okay. It's like facing the bully and we're scared to death of him. But then we put up our dukes and his, his eyes get wide and the blood drains and he turns tail and run and you're like, I knew I could handle this. And then we turn around pridefully and we realize that our big brother is behind us and he's the one that scared off the bully, not us. Like, oh, okay. Well, I'm glad I mustered my courage and put my dukes up. That must have counted for something, right? I'm trying to be like my big brother. And in some ways, that's both right there. I'm going to do my very best to live the gospel and bind Satan by not listening to him. But in reality, when all is said and done, he bows to the Holy One of Israel, not to my flexing of mortal muscle, right? This is the combination of the optimistic post-millennialism that thinks we can bind Satan ourselves, and the realism slash sometimes pessimism of premillennialism that realizes, man, we're messing this thing up. Christ, can you please come and intervene? And as Latter-day Saints, we've got to prove the contraries of our millennialism and realize that, yes, there's work for us to do. And yes, Christ will come as the author and finisher of our faith. I, I'm hoping that makes sense. I, there's a lot in there okay, that I've gone through very briefly. But then the chapter concludes, look at a few last verses. 28, Behold, all nations, kindreds, tongues, and people shall dwell safely in the Holy One of Israel. Well, if it so be that they will repent... So there's justice waiting in the wings behind mercy. But if we can just come, if we can just dwell in him, take our pasture in him, then all will be well. And with that, Nephi wraps up the conversation and wraps up this book 
to create a line of demarcation between what he's just taught and what we'll see his father teach next week. The transition from 1 Nephi to 2 Nephi is pretty interesting. But here's how he ends it. Verse 29. Now I, Nephi, make an end, for I durst not speak further as yet concerning these things. And the end is the period, but the as yet is two more periods, making it an ellipsis, like dot, 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 more yet to come. If he's not setting up this one for a sequel, I don't know what is. <laughs> okay, we're experts in sequels in our days as far as movies are concerned. Well, here's Nephi setting it up for this one. I want to talk so much more about the gathering of Israel. There's so much more of Isaiah I want to quote. Brace yourself. Uh, there's so much more, actually, about the, the promise of the Messiah I really want to focus on. And kind of this apocalyptic pull between good and evil. Oh, yeah, there's so much more to this story. I'm probably going to need to put the pen down and give you some time to rest and start a whole new book. Yeah, I'll do that. We'll call it uh, Second Nephi. Sure, come back next week. We'll see where we are. But that's where we're going to be picking up where we left off. And then, verse 30 to 31, Wherefore, my brethren, I would that you should consider that the things which have been written upon the plates of brass are true. Ah, yes, let me end with my testimony of that. In fact, let me end with the brass plate's testimony of that. They testify that a man must be obedient to the commandments of God. Wherefore, ye need not suppose that I and my father are the only ones that have testified and also taught them. I mean, I've got a whole cloud of witnesses I've been calling upon the last few chapters. Wherefore, if ye shall be obedient to the commandments and endure to the end, ye shall be saved at the last day. And thus it is. Amen. <laughs> I love how he ends that. It's like, yep, there you go. That's how it works. Amen. Drop the mic. Drop the pen. Don't, don't you get it? This is Nephi speaking. And he's ending this first installment of his record. And he ends it with obedience. It's how he began it. This is what I do. This is how I'm wired. Whether it's obedience to iron rod clear command, whether it's obedient to Liahona with all of its marvelous ambiguity and just trying to make sense of where the spindles are pointing. Either way, letter of the law, spirit of the law, it's still the law, and the law comes from God. So follow him. There's a note of justice on the heels of all this mercy. Don't overcorrect. We've got to come unto the Holy One of Israel. So we, he can make us as holy as he is. My friends, I've, I've loved First Nephi. Uh, four years ago when we started this channel, we started it in Jacob. And so we missed all this stuff. And I'm so glad we were able to come back. I do wish that we'd had the time or I'd had the sanity to keep up the pace of verse by verse by verse. But on the other hand, I am grateful for what you're learning without me. Because you'll treasure that even more. I am grateful for what Nephi has taught us in these last 22 chapters. And I can hardly wait to see where he'll take us in the 33 chapters that yet lie ahead. A lot of Isaiah in there, uh, but a lot of reassurance, a lot of persuasive power to convince us to believe in the Lord, our Redeemer. That's the message here, start to finish. So can I conclude with our customary review? There's so much here. I made a, an even longer list and then cut some down just to, to, to keep this from being a repetition of all, 20, uh, all 22 chapters. But to see by way of just phrasing uh, a, a, a clause here, a phrase there, a, 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 a complete sentence, there's so much you can do with any one of these lines. Powerful one-liners is something Elder Maxwell oh, built upon constantly. And here's a few for you. The guilty take the truth to be hard, for it cutteth them to the very center. The most fertile parts of the wilderness, in the energy of my soul, faith and diligence and heed, by small means the Lord can bring about great things. They began to bear their journeyings without murmurings. And ye shall know that it is by me 
that ye are led. Desirous that they might not labor, we might have been happy. Our Father hath judged them. And there was not anything done save it were by his word. The Lord esteemeth all flesh in one. He that is righteous is favored of God. And he loveth those who will have him to be their God. The simpleness of the way. Past feeling. If God had commanded me to do all things, I could do them. The Lord did show me from time to time after what manner I should work. It was not after the manner of men. They did forget by what power they had been brought thither. Not that I would excuse myself because of other men. Even the very God of Israel do men trample under their feet. Because of his loving kindness and his long suffering towards the children of men. The God of nature suffers. Then will he remember the isles of the sea. That I might more fully persuade them to believe in the Lord their Redeemer. I did liken all scriptures unto us, that it might be for our profit and learning. That ye may have hope. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction thy peace as a river, and thy righteousness as the waves of the sea. He clave the rock also, and the waters gushed out. In the shadow of his hand hath he hid me. The Lord hath comforted his people. Can a woman forget her sucking child? I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. Who hath begotten me these? Thy sons in their arms, thy daughters upon their shoulders. Kings shall be thy nursing fathers, queens thy nursing mothers. I will save thy children. All flesh shall know that I, the Lord, am thy Savior and thy Redeemer. By the Spirit are all things made known unto the prophets. Satan shall have no more power over the hearts of the children of men. The righteous need not fear. The Lord will surely prepare a way for his people. And he shall feed his sheep, and in him they shall find pasture. And because of the righteousness of his people, Satan has no power. They dwell in righteousness, and the Holy One of Israel reigneth. I can't wait for those words to become realities. For us to have fully been sanctified by a loving Savior until we are ready to heed him instead of the calls from the great and spacious building. I'm so grateful for what Nephi has given us here. And when we can finally rejoice alongside him that the Holy One of Israel reigneth, we've given him free reign in our life. He's our King, our Redeemer. In the meantime, what should we be doing to prepare for that glorious day? Gathering. Gathering ourselves to him gathering those that are closest to us, gathering anyone on any aisle of any sea with the persuasive promise that God loves them. I testify of that. I am grateful for his outstretched arms of love. I am grateful for the person behind this personal gathering. And I testify of him in love. And in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.